And I say, come over, come over, come on over, you'll see. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Town of Portland podcast. This is uh, your host, Dave Kosminski, and this is going to be our episode 50. And this is going to be the second one of kind of rounding out April here. And uh, with us on the phone is our illustrious Chatham Health Director, Mr. Russ Melman. And uh, how are we doing, Russ? Doing well today, Dave. It's, uh, you know, it's not raining and... and uh, you know, things are things are going well, so I'm, I'm doing well. How about you? Hey, you know, we're we're up and able to take nourishment, man, <laughs> and so forth. So that's that's a, that's a good thing. So a little chilly out there today, but uh, you know, uh, they say warmer days are coming. So we'll see what happens. So yeah, that's okay. I'm I'm, I'm looking forward to it, but I I do in the, I enjoy the transitions. Because yes, they're always you know hopeful when you're going from colder to slightly less cold. Um, you know, it gives me hope. So I, I like these transitional times. Yes, Good. there we there we go. Well, this is our uh, this is our episode fifty, Russ. So uh, oh, yeah. my God, uh, unbelievable! So everybody, well, and and your family. I know uh, had some bouts with COVID and so forth. So yeah, we had COVID. Went through my household. Uh, you know, we managed to uh, dodge COVID for more than two years. Yep. And we you know we've just got this more transmissible variant. Yep. Um, people are by and large not wearing masks indoors. Yep. Uh, we're socializing a little bit more with friends and family than we ever did in the last two years of the pandemic. And, um, you know, the timing couldn't have been worse for us, though, because as we all started to come down with COVID, it was the same week we were supposed to board a cruise ship for a vacation. So um, not wanting to start an outbreak on a cruise ship, we canceled that vacation. So we were all a little bit disappointed. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, such is life, uh, you know. And then we're we're over it now, so well, we're all feeling fine. Well, well, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So, uh, so uh, what what variant are we on now? Uh, right. So <laughs> we're, we're the variant that we're that is dominant right now is we're calling BA two. Yep. It doesn't have a you know a fancy Greek name because really it is still Omicron. So okay. This is what we'll call a sub variant or a sub lineage of Omicron, mm-hmm. and. So, you know, it, it doesn't cause more severe disease in Omicron, which causes less severe disease by, by a, a good amount than Delta. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is more transmissible than the original Omicron. So, mm-hmm. you know, it is, it's very easy to catch and very easy to spread. Mm-hmm. And um, it does, it's pretty effective at sidestepping immunity from vaccination. You're still somewhat more protected from getting infected if you are vaccinated, but it's certainly not a it's not a firewall, you know, between right. you and the virus. So, you know, being vaccinated provides you quite a bit of protection from getting very sick, mm-hmm. but plenty of people who are vaccinated are still getting infected and spreading it around. So mm-hmm. um, it's, it's what's out there right now. And I think it's why we're seeing over the last five weeks or so a pretty steady increase and in even an acceleration in new cases and hospitalizations, um, which I can't stress enough, Dave, how unusual it is to see an acceleration of infections and illness from a respiratory virus in late April. It, yeah. it really doesn't happen except during pandemics. Yes. Every other respiratory virus that we have um, on a population level, we see accelerate in fall and winter. Right, right. Not in spring and summer. Yeah. Um, of course, there will be outbreaks of everything every once in a while. Sure. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you know, on a town, county, state, and national level to see the acceleration of of illness from a respiratory virus is extremely unusual. So that tells us we are still experiencing a pandemic. Right, right. There's still a novel virus that that many people have not been exposed to. I know the CDC just came out with some estimates that around 60% of all people in the United States have been infected with one version or another of the virus that causes COVID-19. Yeah. So that's a lot of people who've been infected. And in fact, they, they estimate that three out of every four children have been infected with SARS-CoV-2. Wow. About half of those infections were with Omicron. Wow. So that just tells you how infectious Omicron was. Right. That in, in the course of about four months, you know, Omicron really only became dominant in December. Sure, sure. So in the course of about four months, half of all infections in the United States occurred. Right. Well, <laughs> so, it- that's crazy, you know, and I that's, think it's crazy. 
you get to the point where I you know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, but um, you know over uh, the, the the COVID Omicron is kind of taking all the oxygen out of the air. You don't you don't hear many people. Geez, I got the flu. <laughs> right, that's right. You so know. it 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 really is just you know SARS CoV two right now. And that's so if, if right now it's it's eight, late April, right? Right. So if you know somebody who has a respiratory infection mm-hmm. and it's mild mm-hmm. or it's severe, whatever. Yep. And they say, you know, I've just got that thing that's going around. Well, that thing that's going around right now is is COVID nineteen. Yeah. So, you know, I think people would be I'd be surprised. Most of what we're seeing out there is COVID nineteen right now. And yeah. so, I'm hearing from a lot of people who were surprised that they tested positive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, they're surprised because they didn't feel very sick. Right. Okay. So that's great. Um, and and they're also surprised because you know they. They had lasted two years, for example, without getting sick. So, right, right. Um, and also, the, the, what's being reported, like the number of reported cases is still pretty low. Yes, it's accelerating, but it's still pretty low. The reason it's pretty low is because people, by and large, are using self-tests at home. Right, right. So the, the cases that we report, you know, the CDC reports, those are only tests that are done at, at official testing locations. Yep. So... You know, if you go across the river from Portland to the community health center, you get a test. Or you go to Walgreens to CVS and get a test. Those are reported. Right, But if you're right. getting tests at home, there's no reporting mechanism for that. So, right. And I think a lot of things are, you know, from that standpoint with the self-test, a lot of things are being underreported. Absolutely. Except hospitalizations. You know, mm-hmm. those are, are independent of testing. And, and we all, we've seen more than a doubling of hospitalizations in the last five weeks. Yep. Um, compared to the low point, still not a lot. You know, we've got just over 200 uh, people hospitalized with COVID-19 in the state of Connecticut yep. right now. You know, compare that to a thousand. You know, that we had during the peak of the first Omicron wave. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, we're sort of not experiencing a significant wave, right, but we right. are seeing a wave. I look at that percent positivity and trying to understand well, how many infections might we have out there? Right. You know, the percent positivity in the state is around nine mm-hmm. percent. So I look back to a time before self tests. Yeah. When, you know, if you were getting tested, you have to go to an official testing site. Yeah, yeah. The last time we had a percent positivity that was around 9% in the state, before we had self-tests, the number of cases we were seeing just in Chatham Health District was between five and 600 in a two-week period. Oh, wow. Right now, we're only seeing about 180 in a two-week period. Oh, okay. So, you know, what I think, I think we've got three or four times as many cases as is a, as compared to what is being reported. Right, so, right. You know, and I'd be surprised, most people I speak to now know somebody who just had COVID-19. Right, right, right. You know, so there's a lot out there for people who are really still very concerned because either they're high risk. Sure, sure. Or they live with somebody who's high risk mm-hmm. or they're not vaccinated, yep, for example. Yep. Um, the, you should probably be considering very strongly whether or not you should be wearing an N95 mask yep. when you're around other people indoors. Sure. Sure. Um, you know, that can go a long way to protecting yourself, even if others aren't wearing a mask. Well, so, I think everybody's become complacent to a certain extent, you know, as far as they that have. goes. And, they uh, have. You know, and you get to a point where, and, and a lot of people are walking around that, that have it or are asymptomatic, you know, so. That's right. You know. At least 50%. You know, yeah. at least half of all people who, who have COVID-19 are asymptomatic, and it could be even more with this particular variant. So, you know, there are a lot of people who don't feel sick. Mm-hmm. Um, and aren't getting tested, and it's so transmissible that if you spend some time with somebody indoors yep. who's sick and doesn't know it, in all likelihood you're going to get exposed and you're going to get sick. Yeah. So you're going to get infected. Mm-hmm. And th- that's just the reality. So I think we all still need to be mindful that there are those who live in our community who, for one reason or another, are at extremely high risk for getting very, very sick and hospitalized with mm-hmm. COVID-19. Yeah. Whether they've got some immunosuppressive disorder or they've got cancer and they're undergoing treatments or, you know, they've got a chronic lung disorder, lung condition or, or you know, cardiovascular right, disease. Right. You know, those individuals, I know we all are tired of masks. Yeah. I, I think if you're going to be in a crowd of people and you're going to be indoors, you know, one way to sort of demonstrate your compassion to those individuals is sure. to wear a mask. Yeah, exactly. It's not required. Yes. You know, and we're not encouraging, you know, no matter where you are indoors, you should wear a mask for right. that reason. You know, if you're spending 15 minutes in a grocery store, in all likelihood, you're not going to expose somebody. It's a pretty brief stop. Right, right. But if you're spending a considerable amount of time in a tight space indoors with a group of people, and you're not eating or drinking, right, why right. not wear a mask? Yeah. You know, 
I, I just I don't see why not. So, um, but I, I think you know the time of, of mandates and requiring those things is gone. I think I'd be surprised to see this right. particular wave peak at such a high level yeah, yeah. that those are even considered right. You know, requirements. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I think a lot of people. Go ahead. No, now, in in most public buildings, I know. Uh, you know, Ryan has, has made, uh, you know, our town hall, uh, you know, basically they're not requiring masks, but they're strongly recommended. So, yeah. you know, they're, yeah. they're not, you know, putting that mandate out there. And I think from this, that's the same thing, you know, as far as in relation to the school systems. You know, I know uh, I had a conversation with uh, with Charles last week and, and you know, he gave his uh, uh, weekly update email to the, to, to the throngs and so forth. And, uh, you know, we've got... Uh, actually the high school had no cases of COVID and we've had, you know, I think the highest case was, uh, was I think a Gildersleeve that had four or five mm-hmm. uh, and so forth. But what, what, yeah, which... that, that's great. I mean, I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that between December and February, so many kids got infected. Yep. You yeah. know, that the virus really doesn't have many places to go when it comes to young people. Right, right, right. You know, between vaccination and so many kids having been infected with Omicron already, right? You know, you're you're thought to be very well protected from subsequent infection for at least three months, right? Right, and and it may be as long as six months. Sure. So, you know, right now, I I, I I'd be surprised if a lot of kids were getting sick with COVID nineteen, um, but it is still a concern. So, you know, now and, are, and are are parents uh, you know having their kids vaccinated, or, there, or is there still a, a little apprehension on that? The vaccination, the number of new kids being vaccinated right now is extremely low. Okay. So, you know, we've sort of plateaued somewhere in the area of 50% range. Okay. Um, and, and so that's, that's pretty low. I mean, by age, I mean, I can tell you for kids in Portland who are 12 to 17, 70% have been vaccinated. Yep. And for kids 5 to 11, it's it's just under 50%. Okay. So the 12 to 17-year-old, that, that's pretty good. 70% is pretty good. Yep. Um, below 50%, not that good. Right. And, and I think we're seeing a very, very, very slow increase week to week in those numbers. Right. Um, now, I the threshold is still, what, age 5? That's correct, age 5. Okay. Um, Pfizer had submitted data to the FDA for authorization for their pediatric vaccine for children as young as six months, and it was not authorized. Okay. Um, because they really didn't demonstrate that the immunity, that the protection um, was very long-lasting and very robust. Moderna okay. just submitted their data for their pediatric vaccine for children six months to five years of age, mm-hmm. um, and that's under review by the FDA. So, yep. you know, we're waiting to see if, there is going to be a vaccine that is authorized for children as young as six months. Yeah. It's not yet. Right, um, right. And, you know, keep in mind, you know, the vaccine safety profile is very, very high. Yep. Um, but, you know, it's not perfect. You know, some people will have, have side effects. Right. Um, very rarely some people will have serious side effects. Sure. Really doesn't happen much, especially with kids. Yep. But, of course, kids, you know, are, are by and large much less affected by COVID-19 than their adult peer, than, than adults. So I think that the FDA is rightly looking very, very uh, uh, cautiously at yep. the, the effectiveness of pediatric vaccines and comparing that to the risk mm-hmm. of COVID-19. Yep. So, you know, while we were all disappointed that Pfizer's was not authorized for children as young as six months, to me, as somebody who likes to believe in the scientific process and evaluation sure. of data, it's heartening that the FDA said, you know, no, this isn't a good enough efficacy profile relative to the risks. Right. So um, I do hope that what they find with Moderna is better and that they do authorize it. But if they don't, then so be it. Yeah, then I guess it's back exactly. to the drawing board. Now, as far as in relation to the, uh, the the second booster shot, what's the criteria for that now? Is uh... Yeah, so if you've had a, if you've had your first booster more than four months ago. Yeah. And you are 50 years old or older. Yeah you're authorized to get a second booster. Okay. Um, if you are a um, under 50 years old and you are at high risk mm-hmm. for severe disease, you are authorized to get a second booster. Okay. So, you know, that's, you know, and people really are encouraged to discuss whether a second booster is right for them with their physician. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the second booster 
recommendation came, it was a little bit weaker than what was than what came with the first booster. The okay. first booster, they said, strongly recommended for anybody eligible. Yep. <clears throat> the second booster, it was simply authorized. So okay. you can consider getting a second booster if X, Y, Z. Okay. And, I, and I think that was an important difference in that, you know, the reason the second boosters are authorized is because they boost immune levels to the point where they will protect people better from infection. Mm-hmm. Um, but even with just one booster, people are still thought to be very well protected from severe disease. Mm-hmm. So the protection from a second booster, does it increase your uh, your protection from severe disease? It does a little bit. Okay. Just a little bit. But what it really does is prevent you from getting infected. So I think that's that's the difference. Right. Um, so right. for people, for example, who live with somebody or spend a lot of time with somebody who is very high risk in their household right. and they're eligible for the vaccine because they're 50 or older, it's been four months mm-hmm. since the first booster, those people might very strongly consider getting a second booster. Right. I mean, it's, it's very safe, especially for adults, you know, very safe vaccine. So really there's very little risk and harm from getting a second booster. Right. Um, and that's why it's been authorized. So I right. think that, that, you know, for anybody who, who is either high risk themselves or lives with somebody who's high risk, and doesn't really want to get infected at all, I think right. getting that second booster is something that they should really consider. Now, do you, do you have any stats on, you know, who, who's gotten the second uh, booster shot? Uh, no, we really only have stats on, on people who've gotten the original booster. Okay. And the people who've received an additional dose, we haven't even hit 50% in the oh, okay. Chatham Health District. Okay. So, you know, right now we're hovering at around 48% of residents in Chatham Health District have received an additional dose after their, after completing their original series. Uh-huh. So that's not very high because at this point, far more than 48% are eligible to get that first booster. Right. Far more people. Okay. You know? And so to see 48%, it, it, it's disappointing because that, that initial booster is going to really provide a lot of protection from severe disease. Right, right. And we again, we are in right now what we would consider the fifth wave of, of, of COVID-19. Um it's not a totally innocuous virus, right? Right. Especially for older adults. So, you know, if you haven't gotten your booster yet, and you're right. an older adult. I'd say the time is now. Sure. You really, don't delay. Well, do um, we do we have to put out another PSA on second booster shots? Uh, well, <laughs> we may, and I think what what's probably you know what what's probably going to happen is as we approach the typical respiratory virus season. Yep. You know, September, October, um, you'll start to see some messages come out that are pretty strongly recommending getting an additional dose, even if you've already gotten a booster, sure. a second booster. Um, because, you know, flu can really complicate things if you get flu and COVID-19 at the same yep. time. Yep. So, uh, you know, there are going to be a lot of clinics going around in the fall and winter. So I think we'll, we'll start really pushing PSAs yep. around second boosters as we approach that, that fall season. So, sure. you know, what I expect to see with this current wave is for it to start abating in the next couple of weeks. I think we'll probably peak in a week or two. I could be wrong. That's my crystal ball. Yep. I think the virus is going to, it's not going to find many places to go. Yep. <clears throat> so I think probably in the next week or two, we'll see a peak yep. and then we'll see it go down and we'll have a couple of really good, strong summer months where there's not a lot of virus circulating. I hope. Well, as people become, you know, more outside and all that kind of stuff. And uh, yes. I think that's going to, yes. you know, make things a lot better. That's right. Um, and then, you know, as we start to approach August, September, October, we'll start to see that winter surge um, take shape. Sure. And, and getting a booster at that point or before that winter surge starts. Yep, exactly. exactly. It's going to be really the goal, getting people boosted, getting people who aren't vaccinated, vaccinated. Right. Um, because, again, not a totally innocuous virus, especially for people who are not yet immune, immune right. from previous infection or vaccination. Awesome. Well, thanks, Russ. I appreciate it. You know, uh, the, you know, I know you had a tight timeline. You had a, uh, other accommodations to, 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 uh, on your calendar and so forth, and you, you had a busy dance card. So, uh, Ryan, yeah, it's, it's a bu- busy day today. So. Uh, yeah, Ryan had a, had a busy dance card today, and he just got in here just a little few minutes ago. So, uh, anything. Hi, Ryan. How you doing? I'm good, Dave. How you doing? How you doing, Russ? I'm doing. I'm doing well, Ryan. How are you? Good. So I, I got to say, I had to call Russ myself uh, a, co- a few weeks back because I did test positive for COVID. Yep. And that was, uh, 
quite the experience. Uh, I think it was a Tuesday morning. I had taken a, a self kit before work and it, it came back positive. And um, I, I called Russ and <laughs> Russ walked me through it. Thank you, Russ, for that. And Yeah, uh, no problem. And so luckily I had a very minor um, case of COVID. I was uh, I didn't feel very well that Tuesday and, and Wednesday, but by Thursday I, I you know I was feeling better, but still in the quarantine process. So I you know worked from home. Uh, you know got a little antsy by uh, by <laughs> Friday and Saturday. I was ready to get out, but um, I took a test on Sunday and I, I tested negative. So that was nice. So it was five days. For me and then uh it was back wearing it with a mask on uh the following week so it was good but thank you again well, russ for your help yeah with that. well no problem glad to hear that that you know you had a mild course i also about a couple of days later i spoke to you i think on the tuesday on thursday morning i had a tickle in my throat i took a test i tested positive um so you know for me it wasn't just a matter of working from home for a couple of days because i was scheduled to go on a cruise Oh, no. uh, boarding on Sunday, and so those those plans got canceled. So my my springtime cruise vacation plans were 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 derailed by COVID nineteen. You know, I also had a pretty mild course, but uh, you know, not only do I not want to sp- spread COVID nineteen around a cruise ship, but no, you know, exactly. cruises still require negative tests before you board. So oh, right. um, for a lot of reasons, we 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 canceled that cruise. Um, and when the family was feeling better and our isolation period had ended, we drove up to Niagara Falls. So hey, there you go. You know, we, we did something for the spring break. Uh, you know, we all had mild courses of illness. Thankfully, we're all vaccinated and sure. boosted. And, uh, and, you know, so, so we're beyond it now. But certainly it can be disruptive to people's lives, even when it's... Oh, absolutely. Fun. Well, you know, uh, it, was the uh, cruise line accommodating on that as far as that? They okay. were. You know, they have uh, this cruise with confidence thing going right now where, you know, if COVID-19 disrupts your, your plans, you know, they'll rebook you. So we have a plan to go in July now. It's not quite like leaving cold right right (laughs) cold cold connecticut in in mid-april uh going to the caribbean but um you know i'll take it so we're going to go in july and and hopefully uh the weather holds and we have a nice time well you know the cruise industries you know has have been hit very hard you know and i think they have to be accommodating and i think they're just starting to you know find their way back but it's still it's a slow go it really yeah they sure are they were around 60 percent um booked for their cruises and now i think they're back up to around 90 percent full so you know i think they're coming back and this is you know this is going to be my coming out of covid <laughs> vacation and i think i just mistimed it <laughs> there you go there you go all right fantastic russ all right uh thanks russ i appreciate yep. it we'll let you go and uh we'll, thanks so much we'll get on with the uh, with ryan's update here and uh, uh we'll talk soon all right take care thanks, all right russ. thanks <laughs> Oh, that's too bad, huh? Yeah, I know. Wow. That's a bummer. I yeah. hadn't heard that. Yeah, yeah. Wow. It's just uh, like, okay, well, we're not going on a cruise. And, and you know, with all the cruise line, you know, as far as that goes, they're requiring a negative test. And you don't want to get on a cruise and find out you're positive. And then all of a sudden, you know, when this whole COVID thing hit, man, they, they had cruise ships stranded every place with quarantine people on board I know. and some of those rooms don't have windows no so no. i can't imagine what those uh those folks must have been going through yeah no but. exactly exactly so anyway all right so how you doing there big guy doing well dave we are uh we're very busy these days with, yes you are <laughs> with all sorts of different projects but like i tell i always say they're all good projects and and we have a lot to get done but um but it's fun work so we're so we're working hard good. um i'll start off by saying that we have the board of selectmen has uh pushed forward their budget yep. and so that is coming up to a town meeting on May second. May second. There you go. At seven p.m. Uh-huh. And so the town meeting is a, a time where residents can can attend this meeting and to vocalize their their thoughts and, and points on the budget. And if enough if enough residents do show up to a town meeting, they can actually vote to to change the town budget, which yep. is in our charter. Yep. Um, I believe that the Board of Selectmen put forward a, a very prudent um, budget that I think takes into account the realities of where we are in town and, and also takes into account that it's not the easiest time for some of our no, residents. not at and, all. And, um, and so we wanted to be uh, cognizant of that. And so 
Um, May 9th will be our budget vote. Yep. And so the polls will be open from 6 a.m. until 8 p.m. here at the uh, Portland Middle School. It will be, I believe it's in the band and uh, the chorus room. room. The chorus room. Yep. And and so the budget, there are absentee ballots that are available in the clerk's office. Mm -hmm. And the budget is open to not just registered voters, Mm -hmm. but also property owners as well. So if you own property in town that's assessed over Mm $1,000, that uh, entitles you to be able to vote on the town budget as well. Okay. And so I, I do want to point out that that is... The property must be in your name. It, you can't own the property in an LLC or something like okay. that. So, right. But um, certainly we want to get the word out on the budget, and we want as many people to to come to the town meeting and, and to also to participate in the budget process on, on May 9th as, as possible because, you know— um, it's uh, right. it, it means a lot to the, oh, to the town, and, and, and it is important. And so I, I do want to thank the Board of Selectmen. I want to thank the Board of Education and uh, Dr. Britton for all, for all their work mm-hmm. on the budget, mm-hmm. and especially our finance director, Tom Robinson. Commander Numbers, that's what I call Com- him. <laughs> Commander Numbers. He, uh, you know, he does such a great job for the town and, uh, you know, really appreciative for all of his hard work on this. Yeah. And so uh, just for as far as uh, where we're at with, with the budget, we do have a, um, uh, it's above all, it's a 2.45% increase in expenses. This year, uh, as opposed to last year, there's a 2.27% increase in general Mm -hmm. Uh, fund expenditures and a 2.57 percent increase to the board of ed sure so uh i like i tell everyone i wish it was zero or we we could go down but just the state of uh where we are at right now with our economy and and fuel prices and all that it is it is very hard to keep costs flat these days sure and and keep in mind we just went through re-evaluation so that changed our our uh our, our grand list consider we had a uh uh, a, a pretty generous increase on our grand list, which is a good thing. Eleven uh, percent, and yes. uh, so that's nothing to sneeze at. So that's, uh, but by the same token, I think it it, it kind of lowered our our mill rate just it, a little. It did. So we're looking right now at a mill rate of thirty two point three nine, which is actually a very important number for us because we made it below the threshold that the legislature has just agreed upon for the capping of the um, motor vehicle mill rate. Oh, okay. And so I believe that they capped that at 32.46. Okay. Very close to our 32.39. So, okay. So um, that's a good thing. That means that we don't have to do anything else um, as far as uh, motor vehicle wise. Exactly. So, right. so yeah, we, uh, you know, that was a, a small win for the town on that. Um, so moving on, I'll talk about some, some so, others. Uh, so in relation to the, the absentee ballots now, yes. uh, can, can folks uh, utilize the absentee ballots and, and drop them in the drop box at the yes. town hall? Okay. Yes. The, the drop box has been opened. And it's checked daily, um, maybe multiple times a day by, okay. our t- by our town clerk. And so you can go to the town clerk and pick up an absentee ballot, and you could actually vote at the town hall you, and, and use that box and put it. Put the and that's ballot. a state box outside. That's right? a state box. Right, yeah, right. it says elections right on oh, the okay, box. Okay, there you go. And so that will be open. It closes at 8 p.m. on May 9th. It'll close. And just as when the polls close, that box is, is locked. Yeah. And and any, any absentee ballots that are right. remaining get brought up to be counted at the polls. And so you can also request an absentee ballot by mail. Um, we are getting kind of close to 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 make sure there's no delays. I, I would advise if you can and you would like an absentee ballot, go into the office. Exactly. Yes. Go go into the. Mike will take care of you. Yep. Exactly. So yeah. So the budget's coming up, and so I just you know encourage everyone to vote and participate in that. And if you have any questions, please reach out to me. Uh, my email address is rcurley at portlandct.org. Mm-hmm. You can call 860-342-6715 and happy to answer any questions regards in regards to the budget or, or anything else that we have going on in sure. town. Um, sure. So 
Moving on, I, I'll, uh, we had an administrator meeting yesterday, yes. and so there's a lot of good things going yep. around all the departments. Dave, it was great. Uh, we got an update on technology, yep. and I, I know you're working hard on the Police Accountability Act yes. and, and making sure that we comply with all of uh, those new regulations, and, yes. we, and we get our police body cameras up and running by July 1st. Yep. Yep. So that'll be something uh, coming new coming to, to the town. And... Um, I've been working with Nate Foley and our Parks and Rec Department on the new park. Mm -hmm. So we're pleased to announce, we announced a, a couple weeks back that our bathrooms are now open during the day. And so they're open. Our new park attendant, Mark Grover, is uh, opening the bathrooms in the morning, making sure that they're cleaned and then uh, closing them in the evening. So that was something that residents had uh, really wanted to see. And sure. we were glad that we were able to do that. And it doesn't stop there. We we got the um, the water fountains turned on this week. Okay. So uh, Dorita was out working on that. Okay. The water fountains are open. And we've also been working on the concession stand. Okay. Our, our Portland Little League has been hard at work making sure that um, they they really wanted to get that concession stand open. And so uh, Nate Foley has been working with them to ensure that we can we can do that this season. And I believe that the stand may be open as early as this weekend. Hey, there you go. So that's a that's another cool thing. Uh, so if you want a hot dog this weekend, Dave, hey. head on down to the new park, I think. And there, you might... there you go. There you go. Are they, are they going to have lobster rolls? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's phase two, Dave. Okay, so we'll, have to, we'll have to wait for for that. But I do like a good lobster roll. So absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Now, um, what, what's the ETA and the splash pad? The splash pad should be. I think all the work has been done. I want to say it's not open until Memorial yeah, Day, though, no. just because of the weather. We've yeah, been, oh, absolutely. Right now, it's not really splash. <laughs> chilly. It's a little chilly right now, but it's all ready to go. And so I know all the preliminary work has been done for that. Yep. So uh, it should be as easy as flipping a switch yep. and and having that splash pad uh up and running so get ready dave yeah i want to make sure i get my speedo and head out <laughs> there, there you go there you go so um another another good thing is i think i spoke about the grant money that we receive or the bond money we receive from our state bond commission yep. for the track that yep. five hundred thousand seven hundred thirty six dollars that that the town of portland received to replace our aging track up here at the mm -hmm. high school and so our finance director and also stephanie in the board of ed yep. office uh worked on an rfq which has been um which has been published so right now we are we are looking for um engineers that to to design scope this, out the project exactly to scope out this project and so that's as far as we can get right now i did speak with the state bond commission we have to hold off on on anything else until we sign the contract with the state yep but at least we have the ball rolling and because i know how important the track is to so many of our residents and yes. you as well yep and so we want to get that going as, as quickly as possible and we don't want to wait waste uh, any any time so exactly uh, so yeah, so that's nice. that's moving along nicely, and and I hope to be able to sign that contract uh, sometime in early May is what it is what I believe mm -hmm. the date will be. Yep. Uh, so we also have the remediation on Brownstone Avenue yep. that's been moving along. We're, we've hit kind of a, a delay with our state deep at the moment. Yep. So unfortunately, they have to review a flood management plan before we can actually get shovels in the ground and, and do uh, the bulk of the remediation work. We can still do some of the remediation work, and that's what's going to be happening now. They can do some, I believe they can do some of the clearing and some other things. But in order to, to get into the soil, right, right. And, um, and also right now, our water tables are very high. Yes, they are. And so that would prevent as of right now, us getting in and remediating that property. So it might, we might have to wait until, um, until early September potentially, right. because they asked me if I wanted to do the remediation when we have our Brownstone Exploration Discovery Park going on. And I don't think that's a, a good idea for, no. uh, to have, to have that major type of work and, and all those, uh, 
uh, pedestrians walking and, and exactly. having fun. So, so that might set us back a few months, but I, it's not, it's not the end of the world. We still have the project underway. And we're also looking at more grant opportunities for the other two parcels, the two, two, two and two thirty yep. addresses as well. So we're looking at that. And I also know our finance director, Tom has the RFP. I've spoken about this before. And that's next in the queue. He knows it's coming. He's got to get that, that RFP done. out um, so we can get a, um, a private developer in there as well. So we're sure. really hoping for uh, a partnership between the town of Portland and a private developer sure. that's going gonna, gonna to re-energize that area and bring some economic development. Absolutely. It's, it's a prime riverfront property. It is. Yeah. It's, it's a great thing for the town. And so, so it's coming along. There's some delays sometimes, like with Deep, they, they're just behind. They don't have the number of employees. Well, and, they're short-staffed like everybody else. <laughs> exactly. So it, it's tough because we want everything to happen right away. And, yep. and um, sometimes we just have to wait a, a little bit longer. So, so, but we're making progress, and that's, and that's what's important. Brainer Place is moving along. Yep. Uh, I believe uh, Dan Bertram should be giving me a call uh, today. We uh, we have to catch up on on the project. He actually invited me out to tour the uh, progress. Yes. Back, but I, I was quarantined with COVID. Yes. Uh, that day, and I unfortunately couldn't go out to join him. So hopefully, I can get out soon and see. Well, all well I've been uh, documenting uh, the pictures of, of the progress, and and basically. Uh, the the place is is leveled uh, other than the historical buildings everything uh you know all of the buildings are down um there is one house um that is left on perry avenue that uh they're they're supposed to be out by the end of the month so mm-hmm. that um i know that was a hold up on uh joining all of those parcels along the perry avenue uh side of it so but you know all of the the hospital buildings that were there are all down been uh demolished and down and removed and it's just the uh, historical structures that are there now exactly and they should be emerging those parcels yep. based on the, our our recent agreement mm-hmm. so that will be coming uh very very shortly if and um and so yeah no the progress continues sure. and it, it's great to see so um let's see what else we have i i want to point out a couple dates we have coming up yep. we have first of all we have our memorial day parade yes yes and, and that will be sunday may 29th yep and i believe uh it begins at 2 p.m mm-hmm. so i know you'll be there dave uh, as, i think so and see. get your walking shoes on <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll have my walking shoes on they are ready so hopefully we'll have some good weather for that. Yes. But uh, encourage everyone to attend. Yes. It'll be a good event. I think last year it was just, it was awful weather. It was damp. It was cold. And it was it was a very it cold was, It was kind of drizzly, and whatever. Yeah. But, so yeah. Hope, hope for a better one. And then uh, some exciting news. Our, our town library is celebrating their 125th anniversary yeah, plus plus two because they of the covid because of covid they were they were all set to celebrate their 125th anniversary back in 2020 and they were delayed by covid and so this year we're celebrating 125 plus two there you go at um and the date will be june 11th and, yeah. and they have a, a bunch of fun events planned at our town green yeah. which is uh next to our senior center behind the buck foreman building mm-hmm. there and um i believe parks and rec and youth services are participating in this as well mm-hmm. and so look for details on that too because yeah. that'll be a, a really fun event coming up yes and let's see i'm just going to take a look what else uh we have going on i think i highlighted some of the big stuff we're waiting on our on our engineering firm for water. Yep, I reached out to the state. I believe we have a plan to select our uh, engineering firm. Yep. the The Water and Sewer Commission made yep. their recommendation as well mm-hmm. a couple of weeks back, and so we're moving forward with that. I am just waiting for the green light from um, our uh, DPH, our state DPH, yep. and I believe they. Had, told me that I should be hearing from them this week. Mm-hmm. So so I want to go home or not go back to work and check my emails too. So well, I'm, I'm doing, I'll be doing a podcast with Lori uh, uh, the, the first part of next week. So uh, Lori and uh, uh, Jack Bukowski from the Water Planning Council are going to be coming down and doing a podcast. So uh, I can uh, uh, put a bugger in your ear. 
<laughs> great, you. great. And uh, so those are the big events uh, that we have going on. I think uh, this weekend there's a car show in Portland at Valley Construction as yes, well. Yes, I believe it is. Three yep. to seven, I think. Yes, the Kenny Fletcher uh, Memorial Car Show. Yes, so encourage residents, uh, if you like cars, to attend that oh, as yeah, well. Oh, yeah, there's always a good time. Always a good time. And so that I think that's most of the the stuff that we have going on. I mean, there's there's a lot more. I have pages, but uh, I'll. <laughs> well, I think uh, you know we've uh, like I say uh, before you got here. This is actually episode fifty of our uh, Town of Portland podcast. So uh, you know, I think this is uh, um, going to be your what fourth at the helm. I think uh, so forth that you've been doing here. So. Maybe. Many, of many more. It goes by quick, right? It, it really does. So anyway, all right. Well, uh, Ryan Curley, our first selectman of the town of Portland, and also uh, we want to thank Mr. Russ Melman for uh, chiming in, as he always does, on uh, the, the latest and greatest from the Chatham Health District. So uh, on behalf of all of us here at the town of Portland, uh, make sure you uh, get out for our Memorial Day parade and uh, get to the activities for our 125th uh, celebration of the uh, the Portland Library and all of the good stuff we have happening here in the town of Portland. So and vote on May 9th. Yes. For the budget. And vote for that budget so we can get there. All righty. Thanks so much, Ryan, and uh, everybody be safe, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Thank you for joining us today. I'm your host, Dave Kosminski. Please tune in every week for new and relevant conversations about the town of Portland. You can find us at portlandct.org or at YouTube forward slash Town of Portland. And now, wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you've enjoyed our podcast, please consider subscribing and sharing with friends. This podcast was produced by the Town Tech Educational Partnership Program, which is a partnership between Portland High School and the Portland Town Hall. If you're looking to start a podcast for your business or organization, check out towntech.org forward slash podcast to learn more.